Hi everyone and welcome to our last speaker session of the day. I hope you've all had a wonderful day so far. Could you just let me know with an emoji in the chat if you can hear me? Awesome, thank you very much. So I'd just like to introduce myself. My name's Laura and I'm the mentor for the Young Scientist Journal student team. Um, and today I'll be, in, um, I'll be welcoming Vincent Nuona to join us for his session. Now, um, can I just remind you before I introduce Vincent that can you please only react with emojis in the chat and any questions that you have for Vincent or if you need to ask for help, can you please send them to our lovely moderator for this session who is YSJ Flynn. So you can go to the chat and start a private chat with Flynn if you have any questions that you would like to ask Vincent or if you need any help with anything technological. So on to Vincent. He is the founder and CEO of eBraver. eBraver is an organization that helps businesses of all sizes to transition smoothly to current technology driven world and has held a remote internship program to train 500 people in Microsoft technologies. Vincent has been presented the 2022 to 2021 Microsoft Most Valuable Professional MVP Award for his contribution to, de to developer technologies. He's got a first class degree uh, in computer science, bachelor's degree from the Wellspring University in Nigeria. And today he's here to talk to us about a timeline of computing yesterday, today and tomorrow. So thanks for joining us, Vincent, and over to you. Can you do up an emoji or something? So I'm sure. Hello. Um, my check. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, great. Um, thank you for that introduction once again. Um, like Laura has said, my name is Vincent, and I want to talk to you about computers and just tell you that they are awesome. So this is going to be one long rant about how awesome computers are, why you should care about them, and why you should play with them. Um, I work out of Lagos, Nigeria, but I work for companies world over. Um, last, earlier this year, I, I, I did a number of trips across Europe where I consulted for a few countries, um, including Estonia, Lithuania, Prague, and the rest. I also consult for companies in Australia, um, for companies in the United States, and um, a few other countries. Now, that is the power um, of computing. That is the moment that computer science has given me. I am able to work for anyone, anywhere, um, on anything, really, um, because of computers. I have titled this talk Computing Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. So we, we can just look at where we are coming from. Um, Look at where we're going or, or what we're building. Um, can you please, Flynn, can you please hit the next slide? So, um, about me, I'm a software engineer and I'm, I'm a technology entrepreneur. I run a small startup. Um, I'm also a gig for every space, so um, I can't wait to go to Mars. And that's a picture of me at a space museum in Prague, Czech Republic. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, what are we going to be talking about today? Um, I, I like to keep this kind of sessions short and straight to the point. Um, so we'll talk about yesterday, the beginning of the information age. We've had a number of, um, the world has had a number of um, periods in history. I, I, I believe we, came, we just came out of the industrial age, um, which saw machinery and a lot of automation around machines and all of that. And today we're in the information age. There's this massive flood of information just hitting all of us. And we're, we're now looking for ways to contain them. We have point terms around them. We have things like big data, big data processing, all of that. So um, this is evident that we're now in this age where information really is gold. People say information or data is the new oil. And 
a lot of very successful startups, setting up businesses around um, data. And we we'll talk a lot about artificial intelligence too. Artificial intelligence is not possible without information, which really is the data. So we're going to talk about yesterday at the beginning of our information age. We're going to take a quick detour where I show you something cool. Um, if you already know what I am going to show you, yeah, that's cool. If you don't, it's a cool party trick to have. Um, then we're going to talk about humanity's love hidden relationship with AI. We're not going to delve deep into that. We're just going to talk about AI, why some people like it, why some people dislike it. And then we're going to talk about tomorrow. What are we going to be building tomorrow? Because the reality is computer science, it's not magic. It's not it's it's not it's not like human behavior where we can predict what people do or what people will become or what the circumstances of um, people's surroundings will do to them. Computer science is something we are actively building, something we ourselves have to take responsibility for. We define our end goal. Say this is what we want, this is where we are, and this is how we're going to get there. And that is how what computer science is. It's something anyone can build, and it's something, it, it, it has such a huge impact on us that I encourage everyone to join in and be a part of that build. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about um, yesterday. In 1965, the computers that we had were really simple devices. And in fact, they were just a, a, a bit they were more like simple calculators you would use in your maths or physics class today. So it was mostly programming to solve simple pro problems. Maybe we, you had an accountant um, doing some spreadsheet logic, or we had some very complex multiplication to do. So we used computers for all of that, and computers were cool. Um, computers were really, we had computers that would fill entire rooms. Um, the ENIAC is one of those computers. And the makers of these computers never imagined that one day, you would be sitting in your room or in your home office or wherever you're taking this talk from and you would be listening to me on another continent on the other side of the world they never imagined that one day computer would, would computer would grow to this extent i want us to take a moment and think about that the the the, the, the machinery that they set in motion so many years ago has made it possible for us to come together today and have this kind of um, conference. To me, that is incredible. And that is technology. That, that is what technology enables. Technology has enabled this rapid exchange of ideas. And it, it, it's just wonderful. Um, next slide, please. So I'm um, talking about computers of yesterday. Um, this is the ENIAC, it's the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, a very big machine. It occupied an entire room. If you look at the picture, um, the picture might look like there are two people posing there, but those people are actually programmers. Those people were one of the first programmers. They do the same thing I do, the program computers, the build computers and all. And the ENIAC had to be programmed by literally removing and fixing wires in certain places, basically controlling electric flow. That is how computer that was how computers were programmed back in the day. Okay, can you please go back? So look back to the ENIAC. Could you please go back to the slide um, about ENIAC? That's okay. So um, the ENIAC was this really giant machine, and it was so ahead of the time. The ENIAC was the, the ENIAC was described by media houses as a computer ahead of its time. But really, let's look at the ENIAC today in retrospect. What what was this ENIAC? It was a computer built um, using vacuum tubes. It had 17,500 vacuum tubes in it. Um, the ENIAC could calculate, for, for, for the number of files here, the ENIAC could calculate the value of pi up to 2,000 decimal places, but it would take it 70 hours to do so. We're going to see a comparison with a modern computer later. Um, programming the ENIAC computer then would 
um, take weeks or days. And when I say programming the ENIAC computer, I'm not talking about writing the programs, I'm talking about installing the programs on the ENIAC. Today, to install a program, all you have to do is fire up your web browser, download whatever program you want, be it a game, um, a software, a word processor, and you hit install, and that's it, you have that program. Prepare the ENIAC for programming or, or for, for installation of new system to days or weeks. So this is where we are coming from. We've come from this giant machine to this really portable laptop which you can just use in your room to do whatever. And so, so, so let's see some of the kind of devices we have today. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, this is a machine called the IBM Summit. This is not your typical um, computer. This is a massive machine, and we're going to talk about a bit about it. I would like to ask the um, facilitator: Is it possible for me to share my screen on this platform? Uh, yes, absolutely, Vincent. If you go to the panel on the right, um, at the bottom there is a share content button. Okay, I, I can see that, sure. All right, um, I'm going to share my screen. I promise to show you something, to teach you something cool. So I'll just share my screen very quickly. Let me know when you can see my screen. Yep, we can see it now. Great. Let's take a quick detour and just um, do a little experiment. And the, be the beautiful thing about computers is we don't need a lot of gear to do experiments. Um, so this is not physics where you need a lot of um, instrumentation or chemistry where you need chemicals and all of that. With computer science, you can do your experiments with just a laptop. And this is one of the um, most appealing things about it, especially for people in places where you, you the, the, the materials you need for experiments are not readily accessible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and navigate to google.com. I believe everyone knows Google. So let's go to Google. This is Google. I'm going to open something called the command line. Some of us might be um, familiar with it, some of us might not. So I'll just open this black shell up. We programmers call it a shell. I'll take this URL from google.com or I'll type it in. Let's increase the font a bit. And you can do this with me. Just go ping and say google.com. Just ping google.com and hit enter. I'm going to let it run for a while and then it exits. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up this um, series of numbers here. We call this an IP address. I'm going to take this IP address and I'm going to put it in my browser and watch what happens. Hey, look, I'm on Google's page. So what just happened? What I want to show you is how your web browser works. Not in entirety, just a very basic version of how your web browser works today. So the files you browse on the internet, have you ever stopped to wonder where are these files stored? How does this whole thing, how does this internet thing work? I'm going to start um, the explanation very simply. Every file you browse to on your system, say Wikipedia, for example. Let's go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is on someone else's system. So we're literally getting this page from someone else's system. Well, how does my computer know what system to go to when I enter wikipedia.com? Every computer has something called an IP address, which is what we saw when I tried to access google.com with my command line. My command line displayed Google's IP address to me. And to show you that this is true, I am going to open, I'm going to um, run a command called um, net config. Well, let's do this a, set, a, a different way. So I'm going to go ahead and open my control panel. I'll come to network and internet. Um, let's look at view network status and tasks. I'm connected to my home Wi-Fi here. I'll click on this. I'll say wireless properties. Um, let's look at details. 
And this is my computer's IP address, 192.168.0.128. So this is my computer's IP address. Coming back here, this IP address belongs to a computer that belongs to Google. So this page you are seeing is literally sitting on a computer that belongs to Google. And that is how the internet works. But then you, you, you might ask, so, so what does www.google.com have to do with that IP address now? Um, some of you might already know that computers do not know what, um, what Google.com is. Computers understand binary. We say computer understand binary. But let's leave binary aside. Let's just say computers understand numbers. Every web page on, um, on the internet has an IP address, or every computer has an IP address associated with it. And these IP addresses belong to computers. So when I tell my computer, hey, go to google.com, my computer needs to ask, what IP address does this google.com address belong to? And there's one way for my computer to find out. My computer goes to something called a DNS server. And a DNS server, um, it's, it's called a domain name server. I'll show you an example with my personal blog. I have a personal blog at vwana, which is my um, vwana.dev. So here's my personal blog, and I'll show you how I connected my personal blog, which is this URL, to the IP address of the machine that's actually holding on my blog pages. If we navigate to this page, I'm using a service called Cloudflare to say, hey, whenever anyone on the internet tries to reach vwana.dev, take that person instead to this machine, but don't tell them they're going to a different machine. And that is literally how um, we link pages to machines. We take the URL we want to, because humans cannot remember these numbers. I can take this number and give to a person and say, hey, whenever you want to go to my blog, you can use this number. Instead of typing in google.com, you can use the IP address for Google. But then how many people, how many IP addresses would you remember? That is why humans created this friendlier version um, to these sites. And that's my, this is um, something cool that you can just know. If you want to, you can explore in more detail how some of these things work. But this is kind of really cool. This is one really cool I like to show to people. When you first pick interest in technology or how the internet works or how um, we put things together on the internet. Now you might ask, so, so this computer that I'm talking about with this IP address is where are they? Because I have my computer here and my blog is clearly not running on my computer. So when I say I link my blog to this IP address, what computer owns this IP address? Where does that computer, where, where is that computer? This brings us to the, um, the cloud. We talk about, about a lot about the cloud, especially now. Yeah, people say things like your information is in the cloud. Some people say the cloud is not safe. Um, some people say um, Facebook has our data in the cloud and all of that. So really, what is the cloud? I may surprise you to know the cloud is not the literal cloud. You know, the cloud is literally someone else's computer. So the cloud is massive clusters of computers um, owned by giant corporations like Google, or Microsoft, or IBM, and the rest. These people have computers, they have so many processing power, so many computers that they allow you to buy one. The difference is you can't buy that computer and take it to your house. You can buy that computer and use it from their um, data center. So they have those massive rooms just full of computers that they call data centers. And let's take a look at how to buy one of those machines from them. I'm going to come to my Azure portal. So Microsoft has a service called Azure, and you can reach it by going to portal.azure.com if you want to explore things like this. So you come to um, Azure, you obviously have to create a Microsoft account to access it. I already signed in. So this is my Azure portal. If I want a new machine, say I have made a new website and I want to make it available to the world, I need to put it on a machine, right? I'm going to come here and I'm going to hit virtual machine. So this is exactly like buying a laptop, except I don't get the laptop delivered to me, but I can use it. So I'm going to hit virtual machine here. So I currently do not have any 
and virtual machine from this account, or I can buy one. I can go in and say, hey, I want to buy a virtual machine. Um, this is good to just take a bit. I can say, hey, I want to buy a virtual machine. You don't have to worry about all of these details. Well, I have to tell you what kind of virtual machine I want to buy. Um, and that can be done here. These are all the kind of virtual machines I can buy. Um, for those of you um, that are familiar with computers, I can buy a Windows 10 Pro virtual machine. It's going to be exactly like the system I am using currently. If I want um, a Linux-based virtual machine, I can buy Ubuntu, I can buy um, Debian, I can buy an Oracle Linux server. And or, you really can buy any kind of um, virtual machine you need to use here. What happens when you buy this virtual machine is you own the IP to this virtual machine. I can then put stuff on this virtual machine. I can put web pages or anything maybe on this virtual machine. And then I would go to a service like GoDaddy. I would then go to a service like GoDaddy.com and I would buy a domain name. Let's say I want to buy Warner.com. Let's see if this is available for sale. Oh look, it's available, I can buy it for 0 0.99 um, a year. So I buy this, what I do after buying this is that I'll go to a service like, like Cloudflare, and then I tell Cloudflare, if anyone navigates to umwana.com, I want you to take them to the IP address of this machine I just bought from Microsoft. And setting up my website is as simple as that. And that's, a, that, that, that's um, really a fantastic thing. If you look at where we are coming from, what I, what I, the important thing I'm trying to point out here is for you to look at where we're coming from in computing, from computers that we used for only things like accounting or multiplication, to where we are now that we're having these video conferencing calls and I can literally get a powerful machine online. I can buy a gaming system online and never have to power it or I'll never have to ship it to myself or I will game on it online. You can buy really powerful systems on portals like this. This is incredible. So um take away from this short um for this short practical is that computers understand the internet understands IP understands IP addresses like Google's IP address. Um, you should check out cloud services. There's a lot you can buy. Um, there's a lot of cloud services you can buy. You can buy databases. Um, you can buy AI tools. You can train your own models and all of that. So this is an area you should definitely check out. And you can start your own blog. You can start your own website. It's super easy to um, start. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and just return to the slides. Okay. Can you please bring back the slides? All right, so um, we were talking about computers today. We, we talked about how the ENIAC back in the day could do the Pi to 2,000 decimal places in 70 hours. Now let's look at what a modern, um, what your regular laptop today can do. Your laptop today can do pi up to a million decimal places in about 10 seconds. Um, please go over the slide. Could you repeat that? Could you please, please go over the slide? So with, 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 your, with your regular computer today, and this is not the IBM summit, with your regular computer today, you can do um, the, the value of pi up to a million decimal places in less than 10 seconds. Compare this to the massive ENIAC back in the day, doing this in 70 hours. That is a huge improvement, and that is how computers are. Computers are advancing at such a, a rapid rate that we need to apply their power we need people to tell us what to do with this computing power. Um, another aspect 
you can see computers advancing various industries. And I think one of the beautiful things about computing is computing, co computing isn't an industry that is focused on self. Even though there are people that are focused on improving technology, technology's consequence is that it improves other industries. Let's talk about medicine, for instance. Any advancements made in modern day medicine is applicable to medicine. So um, we make some advancements in how to better detect cancer, we use it to detect cancer. But we make a machine faster and we can apply it to medicine. A lot of the recent advancements in medicine today have been a consequence of computing. For example, we can make better diagnoses because of the kind of computers that we have to do this diagnosis. We can engineer things better because we have machines to do engineering drawings for. We no longer have to go with paper and pencil route of designing buildings. We have massive um, computer programs to do these things for us. So really, uh, computing to me is this field that encompasses everything else. Any advancement in computing has a ripple effect on the entire world. We are talking of going to Mars today. We're talking about being a multi-planetary species because of the kind of computers that we have. Because we have computers that can calculate trajectories to places like Mars. Because we have computers that can enable us to build the kind of space rockets and to do the kind of research we need to go to Mars. Um, let, let's talk about the speed of the IBM summit. The IBM summit can do 2 billion, billion calculations per second. That is a massive number. That number is so large that it you can't completely comprehend two billion billion calculations every percent second. Um, next slide, please. So um, here are two more facts about the summit. The summit is currently a million times faster than a high-end laptop. And the crazy thing is, the summit is not even the fastest supercomputer we have today. I think there's the new US supercomputer that's much faster than the summit. So think about the speed in your typical gaming laptop, um, your high-end gaming laptops and all of that. The summit is a million times faster than that. Computers like us, like, like this, allow us to do sim um, simulations. So we can simulate weather conditions and predict if there's going to be an earthquake somewhere or not. That is, that is something worth working on. That, that's a fulfilling career. If we can say, oh, it looks like um, with, with this weather part we're saying, it looks like there's going to be an earthquake somewhere, or, or, or it looks like there's going to be a tsunami. It's, it's, that's, a powerful, that's a powerful thing to be able to do, to be able to evacuate people long before we know that these natural disasters are coming. Now, if every person on Earth completed one calculation percent, if every person on Earth, there's over 7 billion people on Earth, that's how long it will take to do what the summit can do in one second. That's, that's an incredible amount of computing power. What are we going to do with this power? Uh, in, in, in my opinion, we are not harnessing these systems enough. The only, thing, the, the only thing between what we're currently doing with these systems and what we could do with them is human ingenuity. And it is my job as a software engineer to talk to people to understand what jobs they do, what their problems are, what problems they're trying to solve in their jobs and all of that, and to use computers to solve them. I work closely with Microsoft engineers and I have regular meetings with them because I am out here in the field um, working closely with these companies. And I understand what these companies need and I relate these things to companies like Microsoft, to Google, or Amazon Web Services, I tell them, okay, this is what people need to do. Um, we need to turn these computers to do those things. Um, to me, that is a very fulfilling career, knowing that I'm taking this um, computing power and I'm applying it to actual human problems. Next slide, please. Could we go to the next slide, please? Um, so the picture, the current CEO of Google said, artificial intelligence is one of the most profound things we're working on as humanity. It is more profound than fire or electricity. Now, before we continue, I will tell you the implication of 
electricity. Um, I, I think we all realize the implication electricity had on the world, but we don't appreciate it enough. Sometimes we really need to step back and look at where we are, look at where we're coming from to appreciate certain things. It wouldn't be possible for us to be having this call without electricity. It wouldn't be possible for you to watch the TV without electricity. It would manufacturing would be possible without electricity. There's just so much. If you take out electricity from the world, it would be a much, much different place. And we're saying there's something else we're working on that is going to have that much of an impact. Artificial intelligence is that thing. Artificial intelligence it is that intelligence that we would go to and we would say, hey, you know what? We, we need a cure for cancer. What is the cure for cancer? And an artificially intelligent system, a truly artificial intelligent system, would take all our data points and it would take all our cells and whatever and it would break it down to the smallest bits and it would say, okay, I found I found what causes cancer. You just need to take this out, or you just need to take that in, and bam, cancer solved. It's crazy the kind of things we can do with this kind of technology. But it's important that we build it right. Um, one of the problems plaguing in artificial intelligence today is bias. So we as humans are finding ways of transferring our own biases towards each other as a people. Um, our differences and all of that into computing. This is why it is important that building artificial intelligence is a collaborative effort. It is one of the reasons I'm very um, interested in it. It is very easy for you to sneak in your own bias as a people, your likes and your dislikes into AI and have AI propagate those, um, those biases. So it is important that as a people, we're all working on AI together. And this is not something that you stand on the sidelines for. This is not an, oh, they'll build it and I'll use it. This is something the world has to build collaboratively. We have to build it now and we have to build it right. The implications are massive. The way we are facing massive challenges with um, climate change. We want to go to space. We have kids out of school. There's homelessness and all of that. I believe these are some of the problems that artificial intelligence can be applied so and when I say artificial intelligence, I don't mean the narrow kind of AI. We have AI today doing um, wonderful things. For example, we have um, kind of artificial intelligence that plays the, the Go, um, Alpha Go game. If you've seen that movie, we have the kind of AI that plays chess and the rest. Well, the kind of AI we're looking to build now is an AI that can truly really learn. We want to build systems that are like babies and would learn and grow and have values and ethics and things like that. And to me, I feel like these are exciting things, these are exciting careers for anybody to pursue today. Can we go to the next slide, please? So um, that, that's really technology yesterday. Technology, yesterday's technology gave us calculators um, and our financial markets exploded suddenly we, our, our mathematics and our physics was no longer constrained to what we could write on paper or what one researcher could do or to Newton's principia. Imagine if people like Einstein and Newton had the kinds of computers we, we have today. They had theories that they could never prove because they simply did not have the computing power to do those things. But we have those things today and we're doing okay with them. We're doing or some things with them. We have reached a point in our world that they never would have dreamt of. And we don't truly see where we are as a people. We don't see where we have come to because while we're living in the moment, um, one ironic thing is every generation tells themselves that they have built unprecedented technologies. Of course, it's unprecedented. No one has built it before. Tomorrow's technology will be greater than what we're building today. But then what will we be building tomorrow? I, I don't know yet. Um, I, I really one can tell, but what we can do is we can build it together. Tomorrow we want to be talking about artificial general intelligence. 
to the smart intelligence, the stuff of sci-fi movies. And even though I might be branching into the range of sci-fi here, technologies have been known to take inspiration from sci-fi. We, 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 we look at people's imaginations and we say, how do we make these things real? This, this is one driving thing for me as a computer scientist. How do I take this thing that I have seen in this movie and make it real? We are talking about quantum computing. Quantum computing is a whole different way of um, doing computing. Quantum computing is going to, there are a lot of companies working on, companies and researchers working on quantum computing now. And quantum computing is a completely different shift in how we're doing computing today. And the opportunities and the threats, and we should not forget threats that quantum computing will unlock a massive. And it is important for us as a people to um, build these things collaboratively, um, collaboratively, sorry, um, to come together and see what is the best way to build these technologies. And you, you cannot have that discourse if you do not have the requisite knowledge. You, you cannot direct, you cannot say this is the direction I want technology to go in if you are not aware of what technology is. I saw a movie recently, um, The Social Dilemma. Some of you might have seen it. It talks about it talks about how technology or how AI through social media is causing a certain divide. How artificial intelligence that these systems use, and it was a moment of reflection for me as a computer scientist. It was so strong that I deleted some of my social media accounts because I I, I just did not see it from that perspective that, okay, this is actually what we're doing. We're causing this divide um, with computers. But in as much as a lot of bad can be done with computers, a lot of good can be done with it too. And it is our responsibility to really make sure that we're on the front lines, um, making those calls, building those systems, and building them right. But what are some of the things we can solve with quantum computing? We speculate that we may be able to solve teleportation with quantum computing. This sounds a lot like science fiction. A few people have done experiments where they teleported um, bits, or I think electrons, or things like that. But someone said that any sufficiently advanced civilization is indistinguishable from magic. Any sufficient, imagine if people from the second century or the third century came to the world today and saw us flying around in airplanes. That would be mind blowing. I mean, what are we going to tell them? How did we get this giant metal things, metal to fly? For I think the people of tomorrow might teleport. And in as much as it sounds like an impossible thing to do today, it's the same way flying in planes sounded like an impossible thing, thing to do to the people of old. I feel these are worthy areas of research. These are things you want to um, spend your time on, um, they are fulfilling. And who cares if you don't crack it today? Who cares if we, I don't care if I search for these answers today and I don't find them. I'm fine with researching them and leaving work for the next generation to pick up and say, okay, this is the work that has been done. How do I build on this? Just as the people that made the ENIAC, just the way they built the ENIAC, and they used it, and they left it for us, and we picked it up from there, and built this huge communication network called the internet. And I can tell you, hey, what are we doing tomorrow, all the way from Lagos in Africa, and Flynn is changing slides for me, and Laura is listening in, and Hassan is listening. I feel like these are worthy um, things to go into. Cyborgs, yeah, I, I, think, I think we're already seeing cyborgs. We, 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 we have this vivid idea from sci-fi, but sometimes we don't realize the ones that are right in front of us. The people that, um, researching artificial organs, things like artificial hearts, um, artificial lungs, and all of that. And in fact, I, I believe some people are already running on, on artificial hearts. Now, now, what is a cyborg? A, a cyborg is part human, part machine. Who knows, um, the other day, Elon Musk demoed um, a chip in a pig's brain um, from his startup Neuralink. 
I, I believe the time will come when we will augment our brain's processing power with computers. And, and then what does that mean? Because that makes us cyborg. So, so we're crossing the, 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 the curse of humanity into what will become in um, man machine interfaces. These are exciting prospects. These are things anyone would want to be on the forefront of. Come on. I mean, who wants to build some of the first cyborgs? So, what are we going to be building tomorrow? I don't know. I have a few ideas for what it is. I have a couple of things I am working on. Really, it's your call. It's my call, ever materializes. And I would like to encourage all of us to explore these things. Um, next slide, please. So, um, I believe that was my last slide. Um, thank you for listening to me talk about computers and quantum computing and cyborg and where we can go with all of these things. Um, if you have questions, I would like to take them now. Well, wow, Vincent, thank you so much for that. That was really, truly fascinating. For someone like myself, especially, who's a complete novice with computers, it's really interesting to see, hear the thoughts of an expert on um, where it is we've been and where it is we're going. Um, I have one question, if that's okay, just while everybody maybe uh, gets uh, their brains back into gear after all of that and, and decides if they want to send through some questions to me privately on a private chat, please. That's YSJ Laura in the chat. Um, so my question sure. is, so I think it's really interesting that you, you think just basically becoming cyborgs is just a matter of time. Um, do, you, do you think you have a time frame for that? And, um, if that's, and, and if so, what ethical considerations do you think need to be made before we can take that step? Oh, well, um, I, I honestly, well, computer scientists are terrible at predicting um, a predicted AI. Um, in, back in the 1950s, after building some of the first computers, people posted, um, it's just a matter, uh, in, in less than 20 years, we're going to have human level intelligence. We don't have that yet. So I really cannot put a timeline to it, honestly. But for the ethical concerns, one of, one of the major concerns for me um, is access. It's one of the biggest concerns for me. Because we're going to see a time if we do um, put computer chips into people's brains, or if we do find a way, the, the people working on things like nanotechnology, for example. So we want for nanotechnology, we want to build computers so small, so small that we can send them into your blood vessels to find faults and all of that, and for it supercharge you. It's tough of science fiction, really. So when we get to those kind of levels, it clearly gives certain people certain advantages over others. Um, the world is already a very disproportionate place. Um, there's um, a lot of opportunities and all of that in some places, and there's much less of those in other places. So I, I'd like to see these things happen in, in, in a way that it's available for people. So, so that is one of the concerns. Um, how do we make sure we're not further setting some people by giving other people things that literally make them superheroes so, so those are some of the ethical um, concerns. Um, I, I think another one really is, does this take away our humanity? So humanity is a, is a very delicate thing. So the things that make us humans, how, how will these things affect our emotions? So um, I, I think a lot of these things are still being studied. We don't know the consequence of consuming information at this rate. So those are some of the ethical concerns. And luckily, the, um, the certifying bodies and, and their processes, the most of these things have to go through before they are approved for use on humans. And hopefully, before we take that step, these concerns will be addressed and um, answers would be found before any of it is allowed to happen. Someone said we often do not stop to ask if we should. We simply ask if we can. So hopefully when the time comes, we are going to be on the forefront asking, hey, should we do this? Is it right? We know that we can. 
So should we do this? So I think to the best way to answer your question is you know, we should all be looking out for those ethical issues. I don't know all of them. Um, frankly, no, no one can claim to know the consequence of that kind of intelligence or, or that kind of technology. But it is our job to look out and to be able to speak out when they start to come to say, hey, hold on, let's do this right. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks. A couple of those hadn't really occurred to me either. So yeah, that was really good. Um, I've got a question from Hassan here. So he wants to know how much a part of computer engineering is coding and um, how difficult is it to code? Coding, I like to tell people, hi Hassan, Vincent here. I like to tell people that coding is um, one of the easiest, easiest thing to learn. Coding is easier to learn than playing the piano. It's easier to learn than playing the guitar. It's easier to learn for some people, for me, than riding the bicycle. In fact, I'm going to share my screen once more and I'm going to show you. Um, before I share my screen, I'm just going to navigate to a page so I don't take too much of your time. All right, I just want to quickly show you something, um, feedback from people that originally believed coding is difficult. So I'm going to very quickly open this up. Give me a second. Um, still here. So I'm sharing my screen again. Um, let me know if you can see my screen. I'm just going to zoom in on this a bit. So this is this is a this is a YouTube channel. If you can hear me and if you can see my screen, Hassan, this is a YouTube channel for program we had last um, earlier this year where we taught a couple of people from Nigeria how to code. This video has 2,800 views. Um, we, we got close to, across all the videos we made, we, we had close to 50,000 views, views. And you can see some of the comments here. This person says, wow, I'm really ready to start building for the C Sharp. Thanks for, these are people that have never coded before in their lives. And, and I, I think the problem I have with, um, the, the problem you find in computing is I find a lot of things very thick. Um, computing traditionally has been this thing, like people believe computer nerds are, are these boring people that sit behind their computer and you have to be a super smart genius um, with your hoodie in a dark corner and all of that. But, but that is no longer the case. Anyone can get into computing. Now, um, programming languages have become easier to learn. Um, how much of um, computer engineering coding? I would say a lot of it, actually, but computer engineering is a mix of building computers and programming them. So you're going to have much less coding than in computer science. So computer engineering really deals with the hardware. You, you, you need to understand how to put um, transistors together to build a processor and all of that. And that's computer engineering. That's a valuable, uh, that's a valuable knowledge to have, how to actually build the hardware yourself. Um, with computer science, you're focused more on, on the coding aspect of things on, on the research. So you take this machines that we are building and you're wondering, okay, um, how does this thing tick? What can I make it do? And that's the um, computer, that's the computer um, science aspect of it. So no, Hassan, computer science is not, coding is not difficult at all. Um, given, if you do want to learn how to code and become good at it, dedicating 30 minutes to one hour daily to a course online is really enough. Within a week, you would have made sufficient progress that you would feel good enough yourself about yourself to want to continue. Um, the good thing with learning is the better you become at it, the more you want to do it. So um, if you do want to check out coding, you should. It's easy to learn. And one of the, my other favorite things about computer science is everything is freely available online. 
you, you can literally become a software engineer at Google by just learning online. You don't have to go to any school for it. You don't need a certification. You don't need a degree. It's not like medicine where you have to take some medical um, um, qualifying exams or physics where you have to have a PhD or some certifying body. With computer science, you can learn online, um, build something out of what you've learned, and just put it on the internet. Hey, people, look at what I built. And before you know it, people are reaching out to you like, hey, how did you build that? Hey, come work for us. Or hey, come let's work on this stuff together. Let's research this. So um, yeah, that's you putting it on hard. If you can get started online whenever you want, really. Um, the only limiting factor is your computer and the internet. And I think most of us have that. We have that advantage. A lot of people don't. So we should take advantage of it. That's, yeah, that's really inspirational. Thank you, Vincent. Um, I have one more question, um, which um, unfortunately I don't think we've got time to answer, but perhaps if you could just make it quick. We had one that said, what could computers from the past actually do? And what was it that made people realize that it was something so powerful? Computers from the past could calculate really fast. I, I think I, I think that was the that was that was the a lot of people um, realized we, we could be doing much more with, with this. The, the sheer speed at which they made um, computer computers. If we had a lot of time, I would have gone into how everything the computer does is really addition. It's it's beautiful to watch. Maybe I would put up a video on YouTube or something and share a link that, that to be circulated. But everything the computer does really is addition and. I, I don't think people realize that, hey, this is this thing about computers that computers could do. I think the realization was people's ingenuity. People started finding ways of making beautiful things happen by just doing addition. At the core of it, a, a computer processor is made up of things called half adders, which literally do addition. So the, the fact that you can hear my voice is happening through your processor doing addition. And people found very interesting and engineering way of doing additions to make it possible for us to be having this conversation. So um, computers themselves are just tools. The reason we are able to do these things with them and the reasons we could do those things from the past was people's ingenuity. Uh, it's like a video game. You spend enough time with a video game, you start to find ways of cheating the video game. You find cheat codes, you find, okay, if I jump over the scope, it would be faster than to run. And then I would achieve my, um, my my time to complete a bit more. So it, it was really people's ingenuity, and then that that, that caused the, the revolution. It was, or I would say, it was a mix of people improving computers, and the, and then the, the really creative people, the the people that that could dream, really thinking, okay, how do I change things to work differently? And those are some of the things that caused the revolution. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us, Vincent. It's been really lovely to have you and hear your perspectives on the science that you clearly love so much. Um, I'd just like to encourage everybody to um, now join our closing session, which is happening over in the, um, I'll put the link to the closing session here in the chat for you all. Is the link for the closing session. So if you'd like to jump on over there, there's a chance to win some more prizes from social media. We're going to announce the student presentation winners and we're going to hear from Celestine, the chief editor, again just before we finish for the day. So thanks again, Vincent, and thanks everybody who stayed to watch. Thank you, Laura. Um, it was a pleasure. Great. Thanks, Vincent. Sorry, I disconnected. <laughs>